My name is Tate Jensen, I'm the Dean of Academics at the Chesterton Academy of Notre Dame, which is where we are, uh, as well as the event coordinator for the Chesterton Society of the Academy. Uh, and tonight, I'm thrilled to be joined by two highly distinguished guests, both of whom have graciously agreed to debate each other on a topic of almost deadly controversy. Uh, so thank you to you both. But, um, so thank you to you both. This topic, of course, is evolution. Uh, and I framed tonight's debate uh, rather narrowly, which was intentional. Uh, Darwinian evolution is associated, and I think rightly so, with an atheist paradigm. Life springing from unguided, random processes set in motion billions of years ago at the Big Bang. But as Roman Catholics, and I'll extend this to, of course, the broader Christian community, um, there is no question in our mind that God is the creator of the universe and that whatever life exists in our universe must exist because God sees fit that it be so. This is not the issue at hand tonight. Instead, the question is whether it is possible for a faithful Catholic to believe that God brought life into existence and perhaps sustains that same life um, by means of evolutionary processes that operate under his direction. In short, is it possible that the Christian and the evolutionist can be one and the same? Or is this a logical impossibility, even a theological contradiction? Is it perhaps an absurdity? Well, this sounds like the makings of a great debate, so let's have it. Yes or no to the following statement. To the Catholic mind, theistic evolution is intellectually tenable. Tenable here meaning that such a position can be maintained and defended against attack or objection. Um, before I was trying to make the rounds here, we are taking votes beforehand and afterhand to see, well, if anybody is convincing up here. Okay? Um, so if you don't mind, just like discreetly at some point before we begin, if you haven't voted doing so, there's a QR code over there, there's one on the poll as well. So again, if you haven't done so. Um, <coughs> arguing for the resolution is Chesterton Academy's very own biology teacher, Mr. Mark Forrester a veteran of classical and Catholic education, and a graduate of the esteemed Thomas Aquinas College in California. Arguing against the resolution is Mr. Hugh Owen, founder of the Colby Center for the Study of Creation in Virginia, an organization dedicated to the defense of the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation. To be clear, neither of these men are scientists. We are joined by avid and qualified students of the issue. So please keep that in mind, certainly when we get to the question and answer portion of the end. The format of the debate will run as follows. This is a, link, a modified Lincoln-Douglas style debate. Uh, both gentlemen will be given 20 minutes for their construction, their constructive speeches. Um, following each speech there will be cross-examination by the opposing side. We will then go into a four-minute rebuttal for both sides, followed by a second round of rebuttal, again, for both sides for three minutes, and then we'll conclude with two-minute brief conclusions from both sides. Okay. Um, when the debate is concluded, we will open up the floor for a few questions, and I'm requesting two things. One, please ask an actual question. Do not merely pontificate, um, and two, please be explicit in whom you are directing your question towards, either the affirmative or the negative, or perhaps both sides. With that, you ready? Let's plug again. Let's begin. <clears throat> Dark matter was invented by Satan to drag our children to hell. Heliocentrism will lead you to perdition. Calculus will rule all, will find all, will bring all, and in the darkness, will bind all. Obviously, all three of these statements are ludicrously false. But for too long, we as Christians have tolerated, tolerated if not indulged in, 
Similarly, Asinine claims that the theory of evolution and Christianity are fundamentally incompatible. Tonight, I do not necessarily plan to convince you wholesale that evolution is true, but merely that evolution is a scientific belief that one can hold in good conscience, that it is intellectually cogent writ large. For more granular investigations, I refer you to a real biologist, as Mr. Jensen referred, but in this presentation, I'll be taking a decidedly Thomistic approach. And following the Dominican maxim, to never deny, seldom affirm, and always distinguish, the best starting point will be by defining theistic evolution. So, by theistic evolution, what I mean is that at the moment of creation, God created all that is in the material universe with the latent potential to unravel and evolve into everything that is now and has been, including living organisms, which have descended from a single living thing that lived 3.5 billion years ago. And that this happened largely, but not exclusively, through mechanisms of genetic change and natural selection. To fully understand how this theory is tenable, my presentation will have five parts. A brief discussion on faith and reason, a look at scripture and evolution, an inadequately short presentation on some evidence for the theory, a theological synthesis, and finally, an appeal to the fittiness of evolution. So, part one, faith and reason. Classically, a science is defined as an organized body of knowledge arguing from indemonstrable first principles. But today the term has been robbed of much of its richness and reduced to revolve primarily around investigations of the empirical like chemistry, biology, physics, and the like. Science today is conflated with reason. So if science is empirical, so must reason. If the word reason conjures only cold syllogism and formulae scribbled off on a chalkboard, then we too have swallowed whole the bastardization of reason. The problem with identifying reason with what is empirically verifiable is that it completely erases the ability to talk about much in our world. If reason only concerns the empirical, then we cannot know about God's existence, let alone his actions, since God is beyond the natural and social world. Likewise, we can know nothing about morality since science concerns facts and morality concerns values. The methodologies would be wholly disparate. Questions about the purpose or meaning of life would simply be beyond the scope Design, excuse me, beyond the scope of science, and therefore reason, if they are essentially the same thing, because the sciences, because the sciences are not designed to raise or answer such questions. But the fact is that we seem unable to keep from asking these questions, from wondering about these things, and that intimates that reason ought to be about more. The truth is that science is a great way to come to know certain facts but it is not the only way to apprehend the truth. It is one among many avenues. Perhaps one could design an experiment to survey which res or survey which results in claiming that statistically speaking, people who commit adultery experience some adverse psychological and or social effects. But Tolstoy's Anna Karenina conveys something not that no scientific study ever could. The general conclusions might be the same, but they're saying the truth differently. To accept only the empirical is to shun a myriad of other legitimate ways of knowing the most important things. To properly understand the role, limitations, and distinction between science and reason, we must recapture a sapiential understanding of reason as described by the Dominican friar, Father James Brent. Reason, he says, is the capacity for wisdom. Wisdom is an all-embracing understanding of reality as a whole in light of ultimate causes, especially in light of the end or goal of all things. This wisdom is not opposed to science, but rather goes beyond it. Reason leads us to the ultimate questions about existence and meaning. And when our Lord deigns to condescend to reveal answers to these queries beyond the reach of science, this is precisely where faith begins. Faith and reason, as Pope St. John Paul II tells us in his encyclical, by that name, are in no way opposed. 
but are in fact twin wings on which the human spirit ascends to the contemplation of truth. It is worth pointing out here, albeit briefly, that this talk of faith and reason does not apply only to theists, but to all who suffer from the human condition of being limited. We necessarily depend on both. Man, it turns out, cannot live on reason alone. But we lean on lower orders of faith almost constantly. How else could I be secure in starting the engine of my car without fearing that it won't explode? Or that it will obey the commands of my steering wheel? Can anyone prove empirically that George Washington was the first president of the United States of America? Am I really able to state confidently that water is made up of two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen? Yet, I can say I know all these things are true because of a faith in the authority that proclaims them. Faith and reason are part of the fabric of our being. Like the air we breathe, we cannot escape abiding with these faculties. When the authority we trust in is him who is truth itself, then we have faith with a capital F. So if faith and reason are the faculties by which we come to know and understand the truth, and the sciences are one of many tools or vehicles delivering unto us the raw material for our intellects to contemplate, then the veracity of Pope Leo XIII's claim in Providentibus Deus ought to be manifest. Truth cannot contradict truth. As Christians, then, we need never fear that the sciences may disprove any truth we hold by divine revelation. The sciences serve us because the sciences serve our Lord and point the way to him insofar as they are in accord with reality. What the sciences can do, however, is challenge not divine truth, but our understanding of divine truth. And this is a marvelous thing. If ever a new discovery in the sciences seems to contradict the truth, we have cause to rejoice. Obviously, we should be wise as serpents and verify that the experiment was done well first, but if it survives scrutiny, then this means that our initial understanding of what God has revealed to us wasn't accurate, and that the truth is more hidden and beautifully intricate than we first thought. The Church has always affirmed this cooperative relation between faith and reason, and admits of no fewer than seven attributes of their relation, whose ex which, trying to expound all seven of these, would take a whole lecture unto themselves. But in short, faith and reason are one, consistent, two, support each other, three, offer defense of each other, four, provide illumination from below, five, offer correction when our, uh, when our thinking makes mistakes, six, it gives illumination from above, and seven, they fulfill each other. Twin wings, bringing us to contemplation of the truth. Applying these faculties of faith and reason to the nature of creation, we can find solace in Pope Leo XIII's words that truth cannot contradict truth. The world and everything in it are necessarily contingent beings relying on God for their existence. Consider this diagram that I am again stealing from Father James Brent. The rays coming down from God are the emanations of existence for contingent beings. The circle is the world of nature, and its area is space, and the arrow represents time. God is beyond the circle, since he is beyond space and time. This is to say that God does not create the world in time, but with time. Likewise, he doesn't create, create in space, but creates a world with space. You may regard this as a crude diagram, but it highlights an important truth, namely that regardless of our view of the order of contingent beings, that is, the world, it never contradicts the essence of creation. We can postulate that the time arrow stretches in both directions, and the relation to the creator would not change. We could say that there was a fixed number of species in the world that never evolved or changed, there would be no change with relation to the Creator. Or if we posited that species did evolve, still <coughs> no change with reference to God as Creator. To take another example, there is no crisis of faith when one graduates from the Ptolemaic model of the universe to the Copernican. Whether the Earth or the Sun is at the center, 
This clarification doesn't touch God as creator. Of course, in modern cosmology, it's not clear where the center is, or if there is one. This does not trouble me as a Christian. I'm not tempted to think that maybe God made the cosmos and forgot to do it with order, without number, weight, and measure. It just means that the truth is something we haven't even imagined yet. And that's exponentially more exciting than disappointing. It is paramount that we begin with this understanding of the nature of creation because it is God's first revelation to man of his glory. It is the most manifest and the most accessible of all his revelations. Our Lord created so that we might know and love him, to reveal his attributes. Father James Brent, Brent again, puts it this way. Nature is God's sign language. Nature is the first revelation to human beings, a revelation accessible through natural reason, apart from faith. And nature is the background for the second revelation of more intimate secrets of God, his triune life, his plan of salvation through the incarnation and the paschal mystery, his call to eternal life and communion with God and the saints in the beatific vision. Now that we are armed with an accurate understanding of faith and reason and the metaphysic that comes with it, let's turn to see what Holy Scripture has to say about nature, about the nature of creation. So part two. As Christians, we have a rich tradition to guide us on how to approach and read Holy Writ, and we would do well to hold in mind that there are a total of seven different senses of Scripture, or ways to read it, four literal and three spiritual. We won't expound on all seven tonight, but take it as a reminder that the books of Scripture can participate in different, uh, can, can participate in, in different genre, and therefore require different methods when it comes to interpretation. When we think creation and scripture, we rightly think of Genesis, which unequivocally promulgates the truth that our Lord created the world. This is a great mystery on its own, and it would be unwise to posit that this text reveals more than it does. Pope Benedict XVI, in his book, In the Beginning, instructs us on this point. The scripture, he says, would not wish to inform us about how the different species of plant life gradually appeared or how the sun and the moon and the stars were established. Its purpose, ultimately, would be to say one thing. God created the world. The world is not, as people used to think then, a chaos of mutually opposed forces, nor is it a dwelling of demonic powers from which human beings must protect themselves. There are, however, other scripture passages that offer creation accounts like those in 2 Maccabees, Job, the Psalms, Proverbs, Wisdom, Sirach, Isaiah, and Romans. We won't explore all of these individually, but we can alight on a few takeaways. Looking at Scripture as a whole, we know that not only did God create the world, but that the world was made from His wisdom, specifically His logos. That it was created ex nihilo, out of nothing. That it was made to exude order. That creation is good. That God dispels chaos. And that God is the only one mighty to create. Of all these creation accounts, only one makes mention of a six-day period. And the apparent inconsistencies, inconsistencies between the first and second creation narrative in Genesis are enough to disabuse us of clinging too tightly to a literal reading of Genesis 1. Every text conveys theological truth. Theological truths about creation. And I would argue that those are more important than any other kind. After looking to scripture ourselves, our next prudent step would be to turn to the early church fathers and see how they regarded these texts. There is no consensus on how they treat the six-day creation account. Uh, they have varying uh, views. But they are very much in agreement on the essential distinction between creation, which does not happen over time, Fine. left, oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> we're moving on. The church fathers are smart. They said good things. Moving on. At the very end of <laughs> this section, <laughs> goodness gracious, uh, 
Catechism says things. It says that we must hold these four things. Namely, that the world was created. The world was created for the glory of God. Human beings are the summit of creation. And there was some historical fall. All right. This is the wisdom we can glean from, uh, from Scripture and from the Church Fathers. But now we want to take uh, move into our next portion of the web of evidence. Moving into the third present portion of this presentation, we'll look briefly at what Father Nicanor Pierre Giorgio Ostriaco, a Dominican priest and professor of biology and theology at Providence College, calls the web of evidence for Darwinian evolution. When it comes to simple truths, nope, skipping that. Uh, when it comes to scientific explanations of one of reality, uh, one can be better than another if it accounts for more facts, and it has something of a predictive power. The periodic table, when it was in, an in, in its infancy, was being pieced together by Mendeleev. When he noticed the patterns of atomic weights and properties, uh, he was able to make stunning predictions of elements that hadn't been discovered yet. And he even knew their weights and some of their properties. Again, without even knowing that they actually existed. Mathematicians predicted the existence of black holes before any were discovered in our universe. And Einstein's theory of rel relativity was first proved right when it predicted Mercury's notoriously mercurial orbit. So what of evolution? Does it account for what we observe? Does that have any kind of predictive power in the natural world? First, I'd like to lay down a definition of evolution given by Father uh, Ostriaco, who says, life on our planet diversified gradually beginning from one primitive living thing and lived more than 3.5 billion years ago. Over time, this one living being became many more living kinds of things via a mechanism that can be explained primarily, but not completely, by genetic change and natural selection. All living beings on our planet, human beings included, are descendants of a common ancestor. There's not enough time tonight, clearly, uh, nor do I have enough expertise to weave for you the web of evidence for this theory. But I will highlight a few threads uh, that I'll have to limit even, even further. Uh, the first one being that of the fossil record. The fossil record is explained well by evolution, and having simpler organisms fossilized in the oldest, deepest rock layers, while younger rocks have descendants of those older organisms. There is also something of a predictive power when this theory is lined up with the record. Until 390 million years ago, fish were the only vertebrates. But then, in rock 360 million years ago, we found full amphibians. If evolution were true, then we ought to expect to find some transitional species somewhere between 390 and 360 million years ago. And sure enough, in 2004 on Ellesmere Island in Nunavut province in Canada, the fossil of the Tiktaalik rose was discovered in rock estimated to be from 375 million years ago. Like a fish, this creature had gills, scales, and fins. Like an amphibian, it had sturdy ribs to help pump air into its lungs and gills and limbs that probably functioned as fins and legs. This transi transitional species is exactly the kind of specimen one would expect to find if salamanders and other amphibians evolved from their sea-exclusive dwelling fish ancestors. There are more things that we can talk about. <laughs> We'll get to this. It was stated earlier that the sciences are great at providing facts. So is evolution a fact? I echo Father Ostriaco's response and say that evolution can be regarded as a fact if we are willing to call gravity a fact, the periodic table a fact, or dark matter a fact. Like Copernicus's, Copernicus's model of the universe at his time in modern cosmology for today, the theory of evolution is the best explanation that we know of. But there may come a day where we have to cede territory to a new idea. This is the nature of science, a parade of ingenious ideas, nearly every one more brilliant than the last, as we flow like a tide closer and closer to the shore that is the truth of reality. Thank you, Mr. Forrest. And that's all we got. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Owen, you have three minutes for cross-examination. 
Mr. Owen, please speak up for the camera. Yes. We both believe that our Lord Jesus Christ became a man in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So the last Adam became man supernaturally in the womb of the Blessed Virgin that had no natural power to produce the humanity of Christ. So my question is, since you believe that on the authority of God revealing, why is it that you don't believe that the first Adam was created supernaturally from the virgin earth, as all the fathers and doctors did. Good point. Uh, had I gotten to other sections, apparently I read too slowly, and I apologize for that. Uh, to be clear, evolution only pertains to the material universe. And the material universe was brilliantly unfolding and unraveling not by blind pragmatism, as our Darwinian or philosophical Darwinian, Darwinian atheistic brothers would believe, but rather it was guided by a providential hand until it came to a, uh, a state that was able to accept the form of the human soul. And so I think we're in agreement on, on that question, uh, that matter evolved, but the soul did not. Precisely because the soul is immaterial. The soul is not part of the material universe. That has to be created immediately by God. But then I would ask why all the fathers and doctors believed and taught that the first Adam was created body and soul instantly and immediately by God. St. Thomas summing up that the tradition is very clear on that. So my question is, what evidence do you have that would lead you to reject that entire tradition? I'm not necessarily rejecting that tradition. I guess what I would say is, what were they working with? What did they, like, what, how much data did they have about natural history? Given what they had, that makes a whole lot of sense. When the, when the most uh, prescient text that we have is that of Holy Scripture, that makes a whole lot of sense. But given the evidence that has come about in the last few uh, few centuries, we have to have a new idea, and it's not irreconcilable with uh, with God as Creator. Uh, and in, in fact, uh, a really exciting um, development in, in current anthropology is that the faculty of language most likely began in a single organism. Not a species. A single organism had to be the first one. Which gives more credence to the Christian view that we had first parents. And this one allows for that fourth tenet from, from the Catechism that there had to have been some historical fall. At some point, the, the living organisms evolved to the point that they could be informed with a human soul made in God's image and likeness. That was Adam and Eve. Let me just ask Thank you, one. gentlemen. That's the end of cross examination. <laughs> Mr. Owen, 20 minutes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Is theistic evolution intellectually tenable for Catholics? The entire tradition of the Church says no. In the first place, according to all the fathers and doctors of the Church, the work of creation is a subject for historical theology and not for natural science. And as St. Thomas teaches, the knowledge proper to this science comes through revelation and not through natural reason. Therefore, whatsoever is found in other sciences contrary to any truth of this science must be condemned as false. Now, the most authoritative catechism in the history of the Church is the Catechism of the Council of Trent, which was the gold standard for teaching the dogmas of the faith for 350 years in the whole world. And it's still authoritative. It defines the dogma of creation as follows. The divinity created all things in the beginning. He spoke and they were made. He commanded and they were created. And it goes on to say that this is how God created all the different kinds of plants, all the heavenly bodies, all the creatures of the sea and the air and the land. And this is how he created Adam, body and soul, and Eve from Adam's side. Moreover, it teaches that all the just 
at the resurrection will receive a perfect body instantly and immediately from God, just as Adam and Eve received a perfect body instantly and immediately from God in the beginning. In both cases, the creation of the body is direct, perfect, and immediate. There's no evolution. The Roman Catechism also teaches that we are to honor the Lord's Day and refers pastors to Exodus 20, which tells us that God wrote with the finger of God the Ten Commandments, one of which tells us that we must work for six days and consecrate the seventh day to God. Why? Because God himself established that rhythm for us when he created all things in six days and consecrated the seventh day to himself at the beginning of the world. In short, God did what every good father does. He did not merely tell us the rhythm that we must live by if we want to live a happy, healthy, holy life. He practiced what he preached by creating the whole world according to that rhythm. In its formal profession of faith, the Council of Trent also defined that when all the fathers agree on any interpretation of scripture that pertains to a doctrine of faith or morals, that is the truth and we have to believe it. And since the teaching from the beginning has been that the entire creation was supernatural, we can't dismiss the unanimous teaching of the fathers because they didn't know as much as we do about natural science. The fathers knew less than we do about embryology, but when they unanimously teach that our Lord took a human nature in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, their ignorance of embryology is irrelevant because the incarnation of our Lord in the Blessed Virgin's womb was supernatural. All the fathers held with St. Augustine that Genesis is a sacred history which gives an inerrant account of how God created all things by fiat in the beginning. Now this doesn't mean that the natural world conflicts with Genesis. It means that we can't work backwards from our study of the natural world to explain how everything came to be. Just as we couldn't work backwards from the chemical analysis of the miraculous wine of Cana to discover when and how it came to be. Nevertheless, the natural world does harmonize with Genesis. In the first place, we see that the uniformitarianism which has dominated modern science assumes that the present is the key to the past. God's revelation gives the lie to that assumption, because three historical realities in Genesis must be known to explain the present. Number one, there was a supernatural creation of all things. Number two, there was a divine judgment on the entire universe at the time of the original sin with the onset of a bondage to decay. Number three, there was another divine judgment on the whole earth at the time of Noah's flood, which explains the Cambrian explosion, the geology of the earth, and the fossil record much better than evolution. For example, we find billions of well-preserved fossils all over the earth, the preservation of which required rapid burial in waterborne sediments. And 95% of fossils are from marine organisms. We find fossils of marine organisms on top of all the Earth's highest mountains. We see sediment layers that cover vast areas extending from one continent to another. We find little or no erosion between the layers. We see oversized valleys, water gaps, and vast planation surfaces that are easy to explain in terms of the worldwide flood, but very difficult to explain any other way. Then we see stasis in the fossil record. The first bats have the same marvelous radar and flying abilities that we find in living bats today. There's no evolution. The Cambrian explosion is not a testimony to the evolution of a huge diversity of phyla without ancestors. It's a record of the death and burial of those original phyla in the sediments of a worldwide flood. And we find numerous reports in peer-reviewed scientific journals of the preservation of soft tissue, blood vessels, proteins, intact strands of DNA <coughs> in the remains of dinosaurs and other creatures that, according to evolution, became extinct tens or hundreds of millions of years ago, confirming that they were buried only thousands of years ago in the sedimentary deposits of the worldwide flood. The mysterious bondage to decay that St. Paul speaks of points to another fundamental contradiction between what we observe in the universe and evolutionary speculation. In the realm of inanimate matter and in the biosphere, we observe an inexorable movement from order to disorder, 
Whereas in Big Bang cosmology and evolutionary biology, we are told that matter has the ability to achieve more highly ordered states without divine intervention. In the biosphere, we see things that were created in a highly ordered state acquiring mutations and becoming disordered. We see Adam and Eve created in a state of genetic perfection so that their children could intermarry without harm to their offspring. And we see a gradual decline in longevity recorded in Genesis. This agrees with cutting edge genetics, which tells us that every human being accumulates unique mutations that are passed on to our offspring, and that most of these mutations are slightly harmful so that they accumulate and degrade the human genome. The most effective propagandist for evolutionism in Europe was this German professor of anatomy, Ernst Teckel, who originally drew a human embryo, copied it, and said that that was the embryo of the fish, the pig, the turtle, the chicken, and the salamander at the same stage of development. He was called out as a fraud by his own academic peers, but instead of being booted from academia, which is what should have happened, he slightly modified his drawings, left them essentially the same, and they went into the biology textbooks where they remain to this day. At the end of his life, in the early 20th century, Heckel recalled how the magisterium had rejected evolutionism for decades, with blessed Pope Pius IX dubbing Darwinism a tissue of fables. In 1878, the Congregation of the Index condemned the thesis that, quote, it is possible to reconcile evolution with Christian doctrine, unquote, because, in the words of Cardinal Ziliara, with his system, Darwin destroys the bases of revelation and openly teaches pantheism and abject materialism. That should have been the end of evolution for Catholics, but it wasn't. Heckel persevered with his drawings, and in spite of the condemnation of 1878, more and more Catholic intellectuals accepted Heckel's drawings as proof of Darwin's hypothesis. Here in the U.S., defying the condemnation of 1878, which St. Pius X reaffirmed in 1907, and Pope Leo XIII's condemnation of the error, quote, that men and beasts have the same origin, unquote, Father Zahn at Notre Dame University wrote a book arguing, along with a host of other Catholic intellectuals, that embryonic recapitulation offered proof for evolution and that humans recapitulated their entire evolutionary history in the womb. Now, for his part, Heckel called the conversion of Catholic intellectuals to faith in evolution evolution's greatest triumph. However, in 1950, in Gemini Generis, Pius XII told the bishops that they must teach that Genesis 1 to 11 is true history, that every word in the Bible is true, whether it's talking about faith and morals, history, natural science, or anything else. He only permitted experts to examine the evidence for and against the evolutionary hypothesis. Nine years later, the world's leading evolutionist scientist, Sir Julian Huxley, pronounced that embryology, as illustrated in Heckel's drawings, offered the best proof that a one-celled organism turned into a human body through a natural process of evolution. Now, this was a moment of truth for Catholic intellectuals. Would they critically examine this proof or meekly submit to the consensus view? Now, please note that the evolutionary misinterpretation of the similarity between certain structures in the human embryo and gills in Hegel's drawings retarded scientific progress even as it dehumanized the preborn child. Little effort was expended to determine the non-respiratory function of those structures, since it was easier to assume that they were holdovers from an earlier stage of evolution. This is the pattern that played out again and again during the last 160 years in relation to the appendix, the tonsils, the human embryo, and the so-called junk DNA. Whenever the purpose of these structures was not immediately apparent, the overwhelming majority of scientists simply acquiesced in the consensus view that they were evolutionary holdovers. In 1970, Father Karl Rahner, arguably the most influential Catholic theologian of the 20th century, went into print affirming that he had gone through all the stages of evolution in his mother's womb, a fish stage when he had gills, a reptile stage when he had a tail, and so on, as shown in Heckel's drawings. So I ask you, 
Did Father Rahner and his peers obey Pius XII and examine the claims of Julian Huxley before they denigrated the humanity of the preborn child and cleared the way for legalized abortion? The answer came in 1994, when Scientific American published photographs of the human embryo and the embryos of the other kinds of organisms at the same stage of development. Those photographs contradicted the claims of all the leading evolutionists and showed that the human embryo is distinct from all the others and that each kind of organism has a unique pattern of embryonic development. Like Heckel's drawings, this typical icon of human evolution proves nothing, but it exerts a powerful influence on men's minds. Within the Catholic Church, however, the Seventh Ecumenical Council defined that church-approved icons teach with authority in accordance with the Word of God. This is what we see in the icons of creation from Montreal Cathedral, made a metropolitan cathedral by the Pope at the end of the 12th century. Now, one doesn't need to know anything about science to understand Heckel's drawings or this evolutionary icon. And the only thing that is scientific about this icon is the McDonald's man. Because it shows that we are not evolving into Superman, we are devolving into something like McDonald's man. Yet many Catholic intellectuals claim that God gave Moses and the fathers the exalted myth of Genesis because they couldn't have understood the complexities of evolution. This is absurd. If God had used evolution, then he could have shown this, minus McDonald's man, to Moses and to the saints like St. Hildegard of Bingen, who were shown the work of creation. And then in our, in our cathedrals, we would have these beautiful icons of reptiles sprouting wings and becoming birds, land mammals going out into the ocean and becoming whales, as our Lord looks on and watches this wonderful process of evolution that he set in motion billions of years ago. The reason we do not see such icons in our churches is not because the fathers could not understand evolution. The world of the church fathers was full of evolution because philosophers like Lucretius and Epicurus and Anaximander were teaching evolution over millions of years for hundreds of years before the birth of Christ. It's nothing new. The fathers rejected evolution because they saw that evolution is a fantasy concocted by men who couldn't accept that there are things that we can't figure out by extrapolating from our limited sphere of knowledge in a fallen world. Things that we can only know from divine revelation. Now, to put that in perspective, consider that the only church-approved apparition of the Blessed Virgin, Virgin Mary in the history of the United States took place in Wisconsin six weeks before the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species in 1859. In that apparition, our Blessed Mother told an 18-year-old Belgian immigrant, Adele Brees, to teach the children their catechism, because there were thousands of immigrant Catholic children running around like savages with nobody to teach them the basic doctrines of the faith. Now, in God's providence, the bishops of the United States had just mandated the creation of the Baltimore Catechism to be modeled on the Catechism of St. Robert Bellarmine. Now, St. Robert Bellarmine's Catechism teaches that God created everything supernaturally in six days and consecrated the seventh day at the beginning of the world. And he teaches that there are mysteries in the Old Testament and in the New that we can't fully comprehend, but we must accept them on the authority of God revealing them. So he says, we believe that God became man in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, even though there's no natural way that the womb of a virgin could produce a man. But he says, we must believe that the plants sprung up at God's command from the virgin earth when there were no seeds in the ground. And he says, if we don't accept what Moses tells us about the creation of the plants in Genesis, while we do accept what God reveals about the incarnation, our faith has become totally incoherent. And this is exactly what we see today. There's a mass exodus of young Catholics out of the Catholic Church because we are telling them to believe that God became man in the virgin's womb on God's authority, but then we tell them that the consensus view in human natural science trumps the word of God as it has been understood in God's church from the beginning. 
and of course the Baltimore Catechism that Adele Brees used to carry out the mandate of the Queen of Heaven taught every Catholic in this country well into the 20th century that God created everything in six days by willing it into existence. Now, with this in mind, I'm going to ask you two questions, the answers to which will demonstrate that theistic evolution is not tenable for Catholics. Number one, when the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to Adele Brees, did Our Lady know the true origin of man in the universe? Of course she did. She had the beatific vision. She knew everything in God. And what she knew in God about creation was what she had learned from St. Anne and St. Joachim from the sacred history of Genesis. Number two. In light of the fact that the Blessed Virgin knew the true origin of man in the universe, is it possible that she would ask Adele Brees to teach children that God directly created all the different kinds of creatures in six days, 6,000 years ago, when she knew that God had actually used hundreds of millions of years of the same kinds of material processes going on now to evolve the bodies of the first human beings? It is not possible. That simple pair of questions and answers is sufficient to prove that the character of God remains the most powerful argument against theistic evolution. Now, it may be objected that recent popes have made statements favorable to the molecules to man evolution hypothesis. But there are two reasons why these statements do not make theistic evolution tenable for Catholics. Number one, every single one of these statements was made of evolution as a hypothesis in natural science. When papal infallibility was defined in Vatican I, it was defined very precisely. The Pope is given infallibility not to define any new doctrine, but only to define a doctrine of faith or morals that is contained in the deposit of faith. You will not find one statement of Pope St. John Paul II, Pope Benedict XVI, or any other recent Pope who finds evolution in the deposit of faith. But the second reason is even more important. When Pope St. John Paul II wrote Fetus et Ratio, he refers directly to Humani Generis, where Pope Pius XII says that when Catholic scholars examine the evidence for and against evolution, they must apply the metaphysical principles of traditional Catholic philosophy. Well, Father Chad Ripperger wrote an entire book doing what Pope St. John the Paul, Paul II asked to be done, and he proves that when you apply the metaphysical principles of traditional Catholic philosophy to evolution, it flunks the test. Final minute. Here's the example, one of many examples that he gives. The principle is, no effect is greater than its cause. The traditional doctrine of creation passes with flying colors, because God, who is the supreme being, creates all kinds of beings that are less in being than he is. No problem. When Father Ripperger looks at evolution, we find that from beginning to end, it's one continuous series of violations of a principle that Pope St. John Paul II and Pope Pius XII said can never be violated even once. Think about it. You get something from nothing. Then something that's not alive produces something that is. If that's not the effect being greater than the cause, I don't know what is. Then something that can't swim produces a swimmer. The swimmer has to produce a walker, the walker has to produce a flyer, and on and on and on. So literally, from beginning to end, evolution is a continuous violation of a fundamental principle that Pope St. John Paul II says cannot be violated even once. So, we've seen that theistic evolution is untenable for Catholics from the perspective of theology and philosophy, and when I come back, I'll demonstrate that it's also untenable from the perspective of natural science. In the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Three minutes. All right. Uh, Mr. Owen, did God create the mule? God did not create the mule. St. Thomas likes to use that example. But he created the animals from which the mule proceeds through a natural process. But God did not create the mule. Then how can it be? Because God created all the different kinds of creatures which had the potential to produce creatures that are lower in acts than they are. We are in agreement, but if God did not create the mule, then how is the mule? Because a horse and a donkey 
are compatible enough that they can produce something that's a mixture of the two. But that's Which means not that God evolution. did create it. No, he did not yes. directly create it. He created. He did not directly, but he made the things with the potential to make the deal. Yes. But the potential is downhill, whereas evolution. Oh, we're not. I don't care if it's downhill. But so God did create the mule. No, uh, because okay. whenever Saint Thomas talks about. It's creation, right. Well, let's move on to another question. Uh, can you account for the albeit rare phenomenon when human persons are born with tails up to five inches? It's a consequence of original sin. We have all kinds of deformities that are the result of genetic mutations that began with the original sin. Roger, and what about pelvic bones and like hip bones in whales, lizards, or sorry, whales, dolphins, and snakes? Any kind of, anything that's part of the standard anatomy of any of those creatures will always be found to be fully functional. But all creatures have been affected. No, they are vestigial by... organs. They are vestigial structures. But Meaning that, they do not serve a function to the living being. That is that has been assumed again and again and again and again. It's proved not to be true. In the Scopes trial, Clarence Darrow deposed the leading evolutionist at the University of Chicago, and one of them said there were 180 vestigial structures in the human body left over from the millions of years of evolution, including the appendix and the tonsils. In the last 100 years, virtually every single biological structure that was alleged to be vestigial has been proven to be fully functional, and the belief in vestigial organs retarded scientific progress across the board. Okay, don't try that. Uh, all right, last question then. Uh, largely in the world, their uh, mammals are placental. However, in Australia, mammals are largely marsupial. Uh, and there seems to be a, a beautiful parallel between a lot of mammals uh, on this continent that is not contiguous with the rest of the world, uh, and those namely flying squirrels, anteaters, uh, and moles. There's marsupials on Australia, placental on the, in the rest of the world, unless there were the continents were once contiguous and then there was a separation and things evolved separately, though in parallel, how can you account for nearly identical species, except for the, this distinction of placental versus marsupial, in an array of animals. It's not difficult at all if you work within the creation flood framework, because after the global flood, you had exactly the right conditions to produce an ice age. An ice age lasted 500 to 700 years. During the ice age, there were land bridges that no longer exist which made it very easy for creatures to disperse. You're, from... ignore, you're ignoring the proposition. The difference between placental animals coming to be and marsupial. Same no. animal, different way of caring for their young. How do you account for that? Because the ancestors of those creatures originated in the same place, but dispersed along different pathways. And because the environment was more favorable to the ones that were placental in one area, they were able to survive. And because the environment was more favorable to the ones that were not placental in the other area, they prospered in that environment. That would explain it very easily. So you're saying they had a common ancestor and evolved into being marsupial on one continent that was not contiguous with the rest and placental on the other. No, I'm saying it's much more likely that each of them had one or more common ancestors that have the same essential characteristics, but that they migrated and they were more suited to the environments where they ended up. That's why we find one kind of creature in one area now and another kind of creature in the other area. All right, we'll save it for the rebuttal, Mr. Forrester. You have four minutes. Okay, four. There were, uh, respectfully, Mr. Owen, there were a lot of things concerning about, about your presentation. Uh, I do feel like the tradition of the church St. Augustine, uh, Pius XII, were all drastically misrepresented uh, in, in, your, in your presentation. Uh, so I would encourage that uh, anyone who has, has heard both presentations uh, to go and investigate those themselves. Um, I, I kind of want to zero in on Augustine. Uh, I'm, I am familiar more with, with, uh, with Augustine's account, uh, and so the church clearly did not posit it, especially when someone like Lucretius 
that guy was a tool. Uh, if he's positing something like this, then uh, I can see the church rejecting that. However, we all, I, I would presume, uh, believe in the atomic theory. That things are made up of atoms. The first person to have that crazy idea was Democritus, a pre-Socratic. No one believed him. And Aristotle spent a lot of ink saying that Democritus was wrong. And then, thousands of years later, he's vindicated. So, fair, primitive ideas of, of evolution uh, were not supported by uh, the tradition of the church. However, in more recent times, with uh, Father Ostriaco, I would agree with him that there has come, uh, come to us a web of evidence. We weren't able to get into everything, um, but uh, the, the information is out there. So go and seek, seek out those, those threads. Uh, no complex proposition should be uh, no complex proposition should be you know, convincing with just one argument. Do not swallow evolution because you heard one argument. For that matter, don't swallow Christianity because you heard one argument. Because things this beautiful and complex and uh, intertwining in our lives require more. But something like evolution re does require a, a network, a, a web of evidence. And I feel like a, a lot of that was, uh, was disregarded, and I don't have time to present uh, any more threads. Also, I'm not an expert, but the web is there. Go and seek uh, that evidence uh, if you are interested. <sighs> there are more things, but I think I'm out of time. Thank you. I don't know if there will be a second to come on this one. There will be a second to was a man named Orestes Brownson. In 1849, every bishop in the United States signed a letter to Orestes Brownson congratulating him on his work in defense of the faith. And when Darwin came out with Origin of Species, Orestes Brownson confronted him the way that every Catholic should confront the proposition of evolution. He said, Mr. Darwin, you are going against the constant teaching of the church since day one. And for you to be taken seriously, it is not enough for you to tell us that your hypothesis could be true, that this is evidence that suggests that it, it might have been like this. No. The burden of proof, the onus probandi, is on you to prove beyond any reasonable doubt that your account of the origins of man and the universe is true. Otherwise, we shouldn't give you the time of day. And that is exactly correct. The burden of proof on theistic evolution is very high. It's not enough for the theistic evolutionist to say, it could have been like this. They have to provide proof beyond a reasonable doubt, or else we are obliged to hold fast to the teaching of the Catechism of Trent that was handed down to us from the Apostles. Now, it is true that St. Augustine differed from the rest of the fathers on the meaning of day in Genesis 1. But these are his words. He says, Genesis is history, the same of the books of Kings. He would have shed his last drop of blood for the literal historical truth of every word in the sacred history of Genesis, just like all the other fathers and doctors. If you read all of his writings, you'll see he takes everything in Genesis literally. The only reason that he didn't take day in Genesis 1 as a 24-hour day is that he didn't have a perfect translation of the Hebrew text of Genesis. He had what's called the Betis Latina, the Old Latin, and it wasn't a perfect translation, and it made it seem that there was a contradiction between Genesis 1 and 2 if you took the days of Genesis 1 as literal 24-hour days. For example, in his translation, it said that after God created Adam, he created the animals. That seemed to contradict Genesis 1, where it clearly teaches that God created the animals 
and then created Adam. But in St. Jerome's accurate Vulgate translation, which is accurately translated in your Deuterium's Bible, it says, and the Lord God, having formed out of the ground all the beasts of the earth, brought them to Adam. So there's no contradiction. So if St. Augustine had had a completely accurate translation of the Hebrew text of Genesis, he would certainly have joined the rest of the fathers in holding that day should be interpreted as a 24-hour day. Now, we were asked, how can you have days without the sun? But until very recently, any seven-year-old Catholic could have answered that question. Here you have the little flower and the question from her catechism, which was used by hundreds of thousands of French-speaking Catholics for many, many years. She learned this when she was probably seven or eight years old. Why were the sun, moon, and stars not created until the fourth day? The answer, they were not created until the fourth day to teach man that they are not the authors of the productions of the earth. God wished thereby to prevent idolatry. All the fathers and doctors knew God created light on day one to alternate with darkness to create the day-night cycle, but he created the sun on the fourth day. So anyone who kept the revelation that God gave Adam and that Moses then restored to mankind would know that the sun is not the author of the productions of the earth and would not practice idolatry like people all over the world have done, including the people in Mexico who were liberated by Our Lady of Guadalupe. Thank you, sir. Mr. Forrester, you have three minutes. Could you be clear after the next conclusion? Close the book. You have five. So five total. that my, my arguments weren't actually rebuttaled. Um, all right. Uh, was Darwin's articulation of the theory of evolution 100% right? No. But neither was Ptolemy's idea of the universe, nor Copernicus, nor Kepler, nor Einstein, and even our current cosmology isn't necessarily true. I would say it's true. I would say that it's fact, in a manner of speaking. But here's the thing. As we learn new things, uh, it's not that we prove our predecessors wrong. It's that we prove that they're inaccurate. I don't want to say that Ptolemy was wrong, because he did account for all of the observations that he could. And he had a beautiful model to represent that. All Copernicus did was update the model. He didn't drastically change it. For Darwin, did he get some things wrong? Absolutely. In 1858, Darwin delivered a lecture to the Linnean Society and opened by saying, all nature is at war, one organism with another or with external nature. It is because of this poisonous notion, which has seeped even into Christian culture and language suddenly, that people quote Tennyson's poem as an apt description of nature. Though nature, red in tooth and claw and ravine, shrieked against the, his creed. As Christians, we ought to reject the idea that nature is at war. And Drs. Robert Ogros and George Stanchu make convincing arguments to the contrary in their joint book, The New Biology. They say that in nature there is more often cooperation, species fighting to make a niche where they can, where they can thrive, in harmony, broadly speaking. This is not a denial that the lion kills the gazelle, but a claim that ferocious competition isn't the overarching theme of creation. One. Killing alone doesn't make war, but killing without thought or consuming your victim does intimate savagery. Darwin did get some things wrong. He was inaccurate. I would not say that he's wholly wrong. Like Democritus, he had a good idea that seemed to fit with evidence, more evidence than he knew existed. But as time marches on, we find more and more evidence that justifies Democritus for different reasons, right? He had different reasons for claiming the atomic theory than Dalton. Likewise, Darwin, based on what he knew, came up with this idea. And we are time and again finding more and more evidence for his idea, even if he didn't hold it for all the right reasons and got some things wrong. So, 
over for a minute. Could you give me 10 seconds to plug in? Thank you. We've heard that theistic evolution is compatible with the teaching of the angelic doctor, but this is not true. If you look in the Summa Contra Gentilis, St. Thomas asked the question, is creation through secondary agents? And he answers, it is in order to cast out this error that Moses, after saying that God in the beginning created heaven and earth, went on to explain how God distinguished all things by forming them in their proper species. This is the angelic doctor himself saying God did not use secondary agents to create anything. And Thomistic evolution is based on the idea that God did use secondary causes to produce the different kinds of creatures that we see. In the Summa, St. Thomas says, listen to this, in the first production of corporeal creatures, no transmutation from potentiality to act can have taken place, and accordingly, the corporeal forms that bodies had when first produced came immediately from God. Immediately from God. Now, when I was an undergraduate at Princeton University, the consensus view in biology was that 98% of our DNA is junk left over from the hundreds of millions of years of evolution, because only 2% of our DNA codes for protein. And since the other 98% wasn't understood, it was believed that it was useless and left over from the hundreds of millions of years of evolution. Richard Dawkins went all over the world proclaiming this bogus pseudoscientific claim and making atheists, including of many, many Catholics. When Project ENCODE was finally funded and the so-called junk DNA was studied, of course we found out that it's not non-functional after all. In fact, it operates at a higher level of functioning than the DNA that codes for protein. And Dr. John Sanford, one of the most famous plant geneticists in the world, points out that in light of what we have learned about the non-coding DNA, we now know that the DNA, DNA sequences in all living things can be read in one direction to get one meaningful set of instructions, can be read in the opposite direction to get a different set of meaningful instructions, and then you can read every so many letters of the same message and get a third set of meaningful instructions. There is no human mind that can create information at that level of density and complexity. But here's the most important point that Dr. Sanford makes in this statement. When information is this dense and complex, it cannot be improved by any change. Any change that's made is going to damage the quality of the information. This means that evolution has no mechanism. It's finished. It means that any changes that take place, if they confer a benefit on an organism, it's, go it's going to be because it actually breaks something that confirms a short-term benefit on the organism, but in terms of its overall fitness and survivability, it will be a negative. Thank you, Mr. Owen. Thank you. Just real quick, I, I do want to say I think that was a gross misrepresentation of Saint, uh, Thomas Aquinas. Go read the first part of the Summa, question 103, concerning secondary causes. So uh, I would argue that theistic evolution isn't intellectually tenable, and we can't say amen to evolution without being declared anathema. I want to go one extra step, however, and make an argument from fittingness. For those not familiar, an argument from fittingness is basically saying one method isn't necessary, so let's look at all the options and see which one is the best. If I need to go to Coeur d'Alene, there are many ways I can get there. I can walk, I can pogo stick, I can ride a bike, but the most fitting way would be to take a car. All right? So this is a great tool in theology. Consider these questions. At the end of her life on earth, did Mary die or merely go to sleep? If Adam and Eve had not fallen, would the incarnation still have happened? 
Speaking of the Incarnation, did Jesus have to come to us as a baby? Certainly he could have beamed down from heaven as a mature adult, tick some people off and be crucified and wrap up the soul salvation deal in a week. That would have been very efficient for Christ. But the fact that our Lord decided he did not do that should give us pause. Somehow, God saw his son being born in a cave as the best option to usher in this new creation. For a hum- from a human perspective, it sounds like the worst choice. But it's not how our Redeemer wanted it. Somehow, other, something other than efficiency was being considered by the divine reason. And I think it's no secret that it was love that was the key to the divine calculus. So coming back to our question about uh, evolution, is it necessary that God's work of development and the dormant of creation took place over seven days? Absolutely not. It could have been one day, or 20, or billions of years, as a lot of evidence seems to suggest. Even without the web of evidence, this last option seems the most fitting, if we hold in mind the question that is more important, namely, why did God create? We know the answer to this one. But most simply, God created to reveal his glory. Our Lord did not have to make the cuttlefish, or the slow loris, or the sequoia, or the Himalayas, but he did, and each one reveals some facet of his genius even the mosquito. The world truly is charged with the grandeur of God. I'm definitely out of time. Thank you. Thank you. It's certainly true that God could have created the world in 57 trillion years in one second, in three and a half days, in any period of time he chose. He's God. But he revealed to us, and the church has always taught from the beginning, that he created the world in six days and consecrated the seventh day precisely because he loves us and because he wanted to give us the rhythm that we must follow if we want to live a happy, healthy, holy life. And we've seen, with the help of Orestes Brownson, that if some other account of the origins of man in the universe is going to be proposed to us, that account has to be proven to be true beyond a reasonable doubt if we're going to throw aside what was handed down to us by the apostles and all the fathers and doctors of the church. And here's the ultimate reason why theistic evolution is completely untenable for the Catholic mind. If it were true, It would mean that Almighty God allowed His Church to teach a completely false account of the origins of man in the universe for almost 2,000 years. And then, instead of raising up saints and scholars from within the Church to enlighten us, He had to raise up godless men like Darwin, Heckel, T.H. Huxley, and Julian Huxley, so that they could enlighten us, so that we could finally understand how God actually created the world. Is that tenable? It is not tenable. God, who loves us, could easily have revealed to Moses and to the fathers and doctors that he used evolution if that's what he did. But he didn't reveal that to us. On the contrary, he revealed to us that he created everything exactly the way he says in Genesis. And St. Thomas in the Summa, in part one, after considering St. Augustine, comes down firmly on the side of six literal days. And he says, look it up, that Moses says one day, because he's defining that a day in Genesis 1 is 24 hours, 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness. Our Lady of Fatima, guardian of the faith, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Yeah.